Welcome tonight. Uh, I want to welcome everybody back to uh, our second lecture of the 2022. And tonight we're very pleased to have uh, Peter Carmichael, a professor at Gettysburg College. Uh, Peter graduated from Penn State University with a doctorate in history in 1996. Uh, and his focus areas are 19th century US history, Civil War reconstruction, Southern history, public history, and cultural history. Uh, tonight, he's going to talk about his current book, The War for the Common Soldier, uh, that was published in 2018 as part of the Littlefield History of Civil War Era series. It's a culmination of years of research on his part, looking at how um, American Civil War soldiers endured brutal and unpredictable existence of army life during the war years. His sources is the letters and diaries of soldiers. Uh, and that's important because our foundation, we support the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, which as the Army's unofficial archives has a wealth of those type of materials in its collection. Whoops, I lost, uh, I lost my professor. There we go. We're back. We lost you for a moment. Uh, so tonight's uh, lecture again is uh, looking at this, the experiences of our Civil War soldiers, both North and South. And Dr. Carmichael, the floor is now yours. You're muted still. There we go. Yeah. There we Thank go. you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. Lovely introduction. And it's a joy to be with you all this evening. I appreciate you all taking your time uh, for a conversation that I hope will uh, lead to um, an opportunity for you to have some feedback, some questions, and some observations as well. I think that that's always important. And it's great to be associated or doing something for the Army Heritage Center. Uh, way back uh, when I first started in this business, I did a fair amount of research there and worked very closely with Dr. Richard Summers. As and if you know, knew Dr. Summers, who passed just a few years ago, he was one of, uh, I would consider him a mentor of mine, and he was a, a wonderful archivist, a fantastic historian. He was just a, a really good friend as well. And so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my book, uh, The War for the Common Soldier. I'm going to do a little PowerPoint, as we all know. Uh, it's almost obligatory to give any talk uh, with, with PowerPoint. So I'm going to do just that, and I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how this goes. I'll try again. Peter, you're muted again. There we go. There we All go. right, I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure why that occurred. So one of the things uh, I'm going to do here is I'll be a little uh, self-indulgent and go down memory lane. Here is, seriously, there we go. There's a picture of me when I was a seasonal historian. Uh, this was taken probably in 1986, obviously at Fredericksburg Battlefield Park. I uh, had a full head of hair, still do, thankfully so. Just a different color now. Uh, I spent my years uh, as a young historian in the National Park Service. It's a time that I uh, certainly treasure. I came to more, cut my teeth as a teacher out on the battlefields giving talks and uh, encountering people's um, diverse attitudes and ideas about the war and especially about why men fought. There at Fredericksburg, I had to give a walk along the sunken road and talked about Marie's Heights and the fighting on December the 13th. Those charges, repeated charges that resulted in about 8,000 Union casualties. Uh, it was a talk in which the story was so powerful, but as Many of you know who have been there. Uh, the ground, unfortunately, is not as evocative as one would like. Most of the battlefield is covered by a housing development. Uh, so it was a challenging place, but it was also a place uh, where people wanted to know why men fought. And you gotta, uh, you gotta move your slides down. You're, you're still on your cover slide. Still on my cover. Yeah. I don't know why that's happening. Let me see what's gonna, let me see what I can do here. Hold on. 
We don't get to see the young, handsome you. Yeah, we want to see that, huh? Let's see if we have to see if we do this. There we go. How's that? Is that working? That's working. There we go. There you have it. So there's the picture. Uh, again, 1987, probably somewhere in that range. Um, as a, a seasonal historian at Fredericksburg and having to give those walks along the sunken road, it was an opportunity to actually hear people's ideas as to why those Union soldiers fought the way they did. Also talked, of course, about the Confederates who were in the sunken lane as well as on top of Reese Heights. And, you know, I, I'd say for the most part, people reduced that explanation as to why they fought uh, to a sense of duty and a sense of duty that they often pointed out was something that we probably could not find today, that what compelled men to do what they did to face that danger, to face what was very likely a, either a serious or severe injury, as well as death, that there was something in them, that they were made differently than us. I found that explanation to be uh, provocative and also somewhat problematic. And so there's two points I want to make, two that I hope you all will think about and something that we can again converse about at the end of the talk. And those two points are this. Uh, the first is, were these men different from us? Um, yes, culturally, they most certainly were. Uh, and that cultural differences, I think, can be reduced to this point. Men of that period, they had a cultural understanding of violence and of death that is very, very different from us. They also had a very different cultural understanding of suffering. And so we go back to that sense of violence and death, which one we know that death in the civilian world prior to 1861 was something that permeated people's lives. They came to some degree to be accustomed to it and familiar with it. Uh, that does not mean that when soldiers encountered death in all of its grisly forms during the war, that they weren't horrified or disturbed by it. They most certainly were. But for the most part, Northerners and Southerners who came from Christian households, that they saw in death a moment, an opportunity in which the departed would do two things. First, that in those final moments of life, that that individual was about ready to leave earth, that that individual would be able to uh, speak about his or her love, love for family, love for home, and above all else, to express one's faith in God. And so that moment before death was seen by Christians as again, as an opportunity, as an opportunity to demonstrate or to prove uh, what one was, uh, was about, what that person's inner self-worth, what that person actually stood for. So that's a critical point. I think that the second point is also a belief in violence, the violence having a redeeming quality. Now, I want to be clear is that these people were Christians, and they knew that, of course, the Ten Commandments is quite clear, that it is wrong to kill. And yet they also saw that in violence, and this is on both sides, that it had the power for redemption, redemption for a nation, redemption for a community, and redemption for individuals. And so for these men on both sides, they did have a sense that to become a man was to kill. And there's just no question about that. I also want to, oh, to stress that I'm not um, suggesting that Northerners and Southerners were warmongers as they headed off to join their respective armies in 1861. What I want to say to you is that they looked to the battlefield as a moment or an opportunity, an opportunity to demonstrate their manhood through violence. And if they were to be wounded, mortally wounded, that they saw that chance, that opportunity to be able to express their devotion to home and to family, to nation and to God. And so they faced their fears and they faced that suffering with a conviction, a conviction religious beliefs, a conviction again, uh, and the centers on manliness. So that's crucial. I wish I would have been able to say that to the people at the park back in the day. I hadn't, I hadn't read about it. I hadn't thought about it. But again, I found their observations to be very important. The second thing they said to us, and this I think is more germane to what we're dealing with tonight, is that they said to me that um, the experience of a soldier is a universal one, that it's a timeless one. And that certainly is true. Anyone who denies that, that's utterly absurd. Certainly men at war and women at war, uh, they encounter similar fears. They have similar aspirations. They go through 
varying degrees, uh, similar training or professionalization uh, to be in the ranks. And so there are similarities. That is absolutely undeniable. But what I found on the battlefield is that the visitors wanted to stress to me that the men who fought in Vietnam or in World War II, or World War I, or the Civil War, that these were men who were driven almost entirely by a sense of duty to their comrades, that they fought for the man next to them and nothing more, that when a soldier was in battle, that he put his head down, he did his duty, did his part, and that that again was reflective of this timeless and universal experience, one rooted in a professionalization of being in the military. Again, a point that I think has some merit, but a point that is, I believe, problematic. And that leads me to my book, is that I think that what I found in the War for the Common Soldier is that there's some distinctive aspects to what it meant to be in the ranks of a Civil War army. Certainly, there are parallels to today, and those parallels are important, and they are, I think, revealing. But we cannot overlook that the important, crucial, Cultural differences that I just mentioned, the technological dif dif differences among all wars, which are absolutely crucial. The weaponry that Civil War soldiers used, weaponry that, as we all know, could fire at most three times a minute. And the killing range in most battlefields, that's a hot topic of debate. A lot of people now emphasize it's roughly around 50 to 75 yards, even though the weaponry it's accurate up to about 300, it can go beyond that. I think that the killing range was much more than 100 yards, but nonetheless, the weaponry that was used, fired three times a minute, it's a muzzle loader. And at that range, soldiers had to use linear formations. It'd be shoulder to shoulder, two ranks deep. There's no way around it. Now for most of the people who came to the park, and I think even to this day, there's not a greater misconception about the Civil War as to how men fought. Most people just argue that it was some kind of allegiance to Napoleonic tactics, that these men were romantics at heart. And what they did on the battlefield was akin to suicide, that they had a death wish. All that is ridiculous. If there's one timeless saying about being a soldier, is that soldiers what? They don't want to get shot and they don't want to get killed. And so the idea that lining up shoulder to shoulder was a death wish overlooks the fact that the weaponry compelled enforcement to use those formations, to fire that way, even though, as they did, they presented themselves as a fairly easy target to their adversary. That weapon, those formations, that is unique, to some degree, to the American Civil War. And it, out of doubt, helped forge solidarity in the ranks. Those men physically touching each other, fighting as a unit, it gave them a sense of being part of a collective. It made it possible for them to subordinate the individual to the will of the unit. The weaponry, the formations, the tactics, all crucial to it and all unique to the war itself. But there is something else there and something very valuable that other historians have helped us understand. And that other thing is ideas, ideology. That is what helps sustain men on both sides at war. And we know because of the fantastic work, I'm just gonna list a few scholars here for you. James McPherson, of course, Joseph Glattar, Chandra Manning, Gary Gallagher, all of these individuals, they dug deep into the archives and what do they find? The letters and diaries that testify to the high ideas that matter to these men. And so I remember I gave a tour at Fredericksburg did it with another fellow, and he was emphatic, emphatic, that ideas didn't matter to any of these men. They had a job to do, and they did it, and they did it well. They were professional soldiers, and beyond what they did on the battlefield, he had no concern or interest in. I think what the work of McPherson and others has illustrated to us is that when the fighting stopped and the men returned to their camps and they got out their pens and their pencils and their diaries and their letters, that what they put down it reflected some deep, serious thought about the politics of the war, about why they needed to continue fighting, about the impact or the effect of combat on themselves and on their comrades. These were serious thinkers. 
And you don't have to be highly educated. You don't have to come from a privileged class, in my estimation, to be a serious thinker as a man or a woman at war. I hope before our evening is done that we'll have an opportunity to be able to look at one of the letters from a North Carolina soldier named John Futch. And John Futch uh, was illiterate. And uh, you might say, well, how in God's name did he leave us a cache of letters? Well, John Futch spoke his letters to comrades. His comrades, I should note, they were barely literate themselves. But the letters, they are incredible because it is if John is speaking directly to you. And in the letter that I hope to get to uh, this evening, and that we can read together, is a letter that he spoke after the Battle of Gettysburg about the death of his brother, uh, Charles, who died uh, mortally wounded, I should know, uh, at Copso on the evening of July the 2nd. Hope we can get to that. It's a big part of the book. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this book is tell individual stories of various soldiers, contextualize those stories. And from that, that we can see larger patterns at work. And I wanted to get soldiers who we often don't hear from. We almost always tap the letters and diaries of those men who were the most educated because we know that the archives does what? The archives understandably privileges or has more resources of men of that class. So I peppered this book with soldiers on both sides, uh, soldiers who were, you might say, on the margins of their society, people that did not have great access to education and people who were dirt poor, man. They're not just grinding it in the army. Their families back home are grinding it as well. And those stories are powerful and they're poignant. And uh, it was something that in, in doing the research on this book uh, had to be one of the more gratifying experiences. All right, I'm quickly here to get to what my problem is, and I'm gonna use the naughty word here, and that's historiography. I send about 30 students every summer out to national parks. They're doing what I did back in the day. And I tell them, when you go and you talk to people, don't use the word historiography. It's like ether coming out of your mouth. It'll put everybody to sleep. And look, I just went ahead and used it. But I'll say, we all know what historiography is. It is about the conversations among historians about particular topics. That historiography on the common soldier, look, it is incredibly rich. I profited from it. And the book I wrote is not in opposition to it. It is to build upon it. There was something that I thought was missing in the more recent studies on the common soldier. I thought the focus on ideology, not entirely satisfying. I felt that at times that the study of ideology, it made soldiers frozen in time. That we get an uh, extract, a phrase, an idea from a letter, and then that would then stand for why that man fought and then continued to fight. That extraction from that letter missed, I believe, so much. It, believed, it missed the physical world that that soldier inhabited and how that physical world changed. It didn't always account for what was happening on the home front. And above all else, it was just a moment in time. I, I, what I wanted to see and what I did in my book is these microbiographies. I, I want to follow a man through the course of his career. I want to see how his words and his actions and the context of the war, how it all interacted. And above all else, I wanted to see the multiple personalities of a common soldier. A man just wasn't one thing at one time. The soldiers themselves, they're very obvious and revealing about that, about how they changed, how in time they were almost unrecognizable to themselves, not just physically, but also intellectually, emotionally. They knew they were becoming different people. And they wrote extensively by that, about that. One of the books that I think speaks to this, and it's a book that's still in print. It's a book that, like all books are not perfect, but a book that I like. And it is Gerald Linderman. I'll say it slow so you can write it down. Gerald Linderman, Embattled Courage. He's very much influenced by the Vietnam War. Linderman, I should add, a long time military historian. I think he's retired from the University of Michigan. And Gerald Linderman does a fantastic job in explaining how the idealism of the war in 1861 
how that came under attack through experiences in the field, not just on the battlefield, but in camp, and how the soldiers came to articulate a more hardened uh, version of courage. And Battled Courage is the book. Gerald Linderman is quite good. All right, I'm going to try to move aside here. I'm getting tired of looking at me. I'm sure I'm tired of it. Let's see how I can do this. All right, we're almost there. Let's see how far I got. I am. Maybe it'll come down here. Let's see. There we go. All right, now we got it. So um, the questions I had about the historiography uh, arose in an afternoon at the Gettysburg Battlefield Visitor Center. And I was just looking around at some books and I picked this book up. No Freedom Shrieker, uh, the letters of Charles Biddlecombe. Uh, Kathy Aldridge, the editor, who is not a professional historian, uh, she does like ultra marathons or something like that. Uh, and I came to know her, obviously, you know, I, this is one of my favorite books, I should note. Get it off of Amazon in paperback. It's well worth picking up. The letters are, are fantastic. Uh, she bought a house with her husband in upstate New York. The attic was full of all kinds of things and they were discarding what was mostly junk, she said. They found an old whiskey box and in that whiskey box were a bunch of Sephora letters and they were the letters of Charles Biddlecock. She then set up, she transcribed them, she did a fantastic job editing them. And I love Biddlecock's story because his story underscores how soldiers could be many different things during the course of the war. The second point, and the point that I stress in this book, is the best way I think to, if you have to, broadly characterize the experience of the soldier do it through the lens of pragmatism. Pragmatism, not just in thought, but in action. Pragmatism is the framing device that I think holds my book together. And pragmatism allows, again, us to help the soldier, help us understand how the soldiers navigated the circumstances of war. They got to bring in that physical world. He got to bring in the changing environment of the war. Those things impinged upon the lives of these soldiers. They had to adjust and adapt. That's pragmatism. Adjust and adapt. Again, not just in action, but in thought as well. And we're going to see here in this very quick biography I'm going to give you of Charles Biddlecombe, that very transformation. All right. Let me get behind you here. So Biddlecombe, uh, he was a farmer, Monroe County, um, New York. He enlisted briefly, he enlisted in 1861, he got sick, he returned home, and he was utterly miserable. Uh, largely miserable because, to be just perfectly frank, uh, he had, uh, he's, he was a very difficult man. It's clear from his letters, it's clear from what Kathy Aldridge found. He had a hard time getting along with anyone. I think only his wife seemed to like him. He felt estranged from his family, called himself the black sheep of the family. Uh, by 1860, uh, Fall of 1863, there was conscription. I'm not sure why he was drafted because he was sick and he'd been in the army, but nonetheless, they were going to pull his name, or they did, I should say, and he went ahead into the army in the fall of 1863. He was a person, and you can get it from the title here, he said that he was no freedom shrieker or a union savior. I'll say it again. No freedom shrieker is referring to an abolitionist. So he's like, look, I'm not one of those people. I'm not an abolitionist. And he said, I'm, nor am I a union saver, right? So he's trying, he's not trying, he's making the case that he's really not political about this war at all. But he's in it. And uh, he gets for his train in Moreau County, heads down and he's dropped off at Elmira. Hopped off that train, he was given a blanket, and he was sent uh, to sleep on a cold, hard floor that night. He was shivering. He said he thought he was going to freeze to death. This, again, is his first night in the Army. And he woke up, wrote a letter to his wife, and he said, I have the foundation of a discharge already in the shape of a bad cold and rheumatism. Obviously, this is a man who is not familiar with the surgeons in the Army. Rheumatism and a cold is not going to get you out of anything. In fact, they're going to see you and think that you're a shirker. He, of course, had to get back on that train. Next stop, near Culpeper, Virginia, where the Army of the Potomac is nestled in the fall of 63. 
He has put with the 147th Pennsylvania. It's a veteran unit. Many of you know, of course, they saw some pretty heavy fighting on July 1st right here at Gettysburg. So he got into that regiment and he's still miserable, man. He doesn't like the veterans. He doesn't like his officers. He thinks every march and every drill is pointless and worthless. And in fact, after one march, an extraordinarily difficult one, again, this is the fall of 63, he collapsed by the roadside. And I will now quote him. In a 24-hour period, he said that he expelled over 30 passages of the bowels and passed so much blood and mucus and became so weak that he could hardly stand alone. Well, he then went to the regimental surgeon thinking, of course, that he had a good case for his discharge. And of course, the surgeon said, absolutely not. The surgeon was suspicious of him, suspicious of him because he took his bounty. When he got into that army, he took his bounty. And he said that he should have thought about that before he decided to come into the Army of the Potomac. Biddlecombe's frustrations became so great that he wrote in November of 63 this. Cursed be the day that I saw my name drawn as a conscript and damned be the hour that I made up my mind to come as a draftee. I think sometimes that if it was not for you and my children, I would blow out my brains. Damn the South, damn the war and all that had anything to do in getting it up. Now, spring of 64, um, some degree Biddlecombe had resigned himself to what he was confronting. But uh, he was tempted to still desert. May came. Everyone's in anticipation of the spring campaign. A few men in his regiment that called themselves uh, the Blue Ridge Brigade, uh, because of course they looked to the Blue Ridge, which would have been west of Culpeper, and they used that Blue Ridge too to desert. Right? You head up the spine of the Blue Ridge, you get into this country here, central PA, and uh, you could hide out for the remainder of the war, I guess, if one wanted or could continue all the way up to Canada. Uh, these men did their best to convince Biddlecombe to leave the regiment before the fighting started. In the end, he decided not to do that. And in part, it is this. It is because he was beginning uh, to feel that his reputation as a man, that it was being built for maybe the very first time in his life by standing in the ranks and shouldering a musket. I want to again stress that he felt estranged from his family. He felt they did not care for him at all, except for his wife. But he believed that his parents, as well as his sisters, had a very low opinion of him. And now the fighting began, and there's Biddlecombe, and he is in the thick of the Overland campaign. His um, very first letter, which is in the middle of the campaign, I think it's either May 10th or May 12th, so it's right in Spotsylvania. It is just a short statement of survival. And like so many of those that I've read, the men, they are mystified that they're on the right side of the side. Uh, he even sort of attributes in a very sort of confused way that maybe Providence has something to do with his survival, but he is undoubtedly bewildered uh, by what he has seen and by what he has done. The fighting came to a close at the end of the uh, Overland campaign, as you know, and we're now post Cold Harbor, so we're early June of 1864, and he writes this. Men are beginning to get sick now that the excitement of battle has cooled off a little. They are thinking over the narrow escapes they have had and counting up those friends that have been killed or wounded. Sad are the faces and full of grief. Dreary foreboding fills our hearts as we think of what has been done and what is left and what is yet left to be done. Now, just a side note here, one other thing, we can have a conversation about this point, is that this quote is a quote that my students latch onto as evidence that Civil War soldiers, that they experienced PTSD. And again, you all are, of course, entitled to your opinion about this. One of the problems with the PTSD diagnosis is not only, of course, is it a modern diagnosis, but it's a diagnosis that today has become so expansive that it almost includes any form of trauma. I don't want to again get us off the track here, but I look at these words as you look at them now, and I would just suggest to you that a man who has hard, horrible memories from going and surviving the killing fields of the Civil War, just because you have bad and horrible memories 
does not mean that you necessarily have PTSD. I'm not saying that these men or that Biddlecom did not have it, but what I'm saying to you to remind you of is that these men, again, they are hardwired differently to remind you that violence is what made a man. And ultimately, we know that Charles Biddlecom, in going through this, he was transformed, but transformed in a way that he, for the, probably again, the first time in his life, thought that he was, and here's the key word, it's the word that they used in the Civil War, both sides. And the word is reputation. He already had a reputation. Well, there you have it. And then, let me go. He follows this up with another letter at the end of the campaign. Boy, I'd really like for this to advance. There you go. I hate this life worse than a cat does hot soup. If I ever get out, I'll stuff my old uniform with straw, stand it up in one corner to look at when I feel out of humor. Just to remind me that home, with its little cares and troubles, is not the worst place in the world for a man to enjoy life. Well, we can see he made it through the Overland campaign, but we see this is more weirdness. This is absolute more weirdness. And we can understand that that idea that his uniform, his coat, that in a sense, it almost symbolizes not just his subjugation, but it symbolized to him this horrible, horrific violence that he had just passed through. And here's a picture, which I know many of you have seen something like this before. This is a sock coat. It's not his, but that's what he was referring to. That's what he wanted to stuff and he wanted to put in his office. All right. So shortly after he wrote the letter I just quoted from, he's issued a new sock coat just like this, and he's got to give away his old sock coat. This is what he says about his old sack coat. Remember, the one that he wanted to stuff and put in his office. Now he writes, I should like to save it, the sack coat, as it is a souvenir of the hard-fought battles of the wilderness, Laurel Hill, Spotsylvania, North Anna, Anna, and Petersburg. I should like to keep it with all of its dust samples and different soil from Culpeper to this place. Tis not much of a coat now, the skirt's torn and ragged, and it is sadly ripped under the arms. Still, as I look at it, as it hangs on the butt of my musket, I think more of it than I ever did of any article address I ever owned in my life before. It's pretty remarkable, right? Now, again, I'm not here to point out that this man uh, contradicted himself earlier. That's silly. There's nothing to be gained from that. We're all full of tensions and contradictions. What I'll say to you again is that there are many masks that soldiers wore many personalities. And here we see those personalities come to the surface when we do what? When we stop looking at a single letter, when we stop extracting a few words from a moment in time, but when we start to string the body of letters, when we take in the fullness of the collection, we can see how these men can be very different things at very different times. Charles Biddlecombe did not deserve Charles Biddlecombe in the fall of 1864, presidential election, as you know, between George B. McClellan and Abraham Lincoln, had none other than Biddlecombe supporting old Abe. Adamant in his uh, belief that, McClellan, excuse me, that Lincoln was the right man, adamant that a vote for Lincoln would be the best way to prosecute the war, and adamant in the end that the war for union, which now is a war for union and emancipation, that it was worth his blood, worth his sacrifice. And so we have this man who said that he was no freedom shrieker, no union savior. He had become what? Become a union savior. Now, he might have hated black folks. He might have not given a damn about slavery. I don't know, but I do know this. If you supported the cause of union in 1864, you could screech all you wanted about the wrongness of emancipation. But if you're fighting the Union Army, you're still fighting for emancipation. So there we have Biddlecombe. And Biddlecombe for me, and that body of letters, which I again encourage you all to get a chance to pick, pick up that book. It is a fine one. It is a book that helps us see how a Civil War soldier evolved and changed over the course of the war and the uncertainty. And I want to stress that the uncertainty that these men felt, how they were changing. I'm going to give you just a quick anecdote. It's from a, a Georgia soldier named Wright Benson. Again, a guy who I believe was illiterate or semi-literate. And it's one of the saddest letters I ever came across. 
It's a letter in which he spoke to his wife and describing the conditions in his camp, telling her that he barely had anything to eat, that he was absolutely broke, that he had just a little piece of soap, but that he had been able to bathe in weeks. And they said he was black as a sow. That's his quote, black as a sow. And he also told his wife that he was sorry. Not that he was sorry to her, but sorry that probably got lice, right? And so at the very end of this letter, he's feeling because of his physical condition, because of his poverty, he's feeling that he's not a man. And the real tragedy, he feels that he's not even a worthy father. And he said just that, said it to his wife in that paper. He said, tell my son that he has a father. Here's where Sally comes in. Tell my son he has a father, but a sorry one. A sorry one. Again, bringing the words and the physical condition and being sensitive to the place, man. This man is a poor soldier. His experience rooted in that physical place is much different than one of his officers. Uh, the real tragedy of Wright Vincent is that 1863, he contracts smallpox. He almost deserted. His brother tried to get him to desert, didn't do it. Contracted smallpox. He's quarantined. And in that quarantine, he has an attendant. And he's dictating his letter. And in that letter, he says that he has a picture of his wife and child. And he's looking at it. He says it's so lifelike. But he can't even touch the envelope. He can't even touch the letter because he's fearful that he will pass smallpox to his family, which of course he ultimately dies from. And I'm going to keep on this thread here. I want to remind you all who I assume many of you live in this area. I know virtually every person here has been to a Civil War battlefield. I want us to think about the stories we tell, the stories that come to the surface. They don't just happen to come to the surface. We make choices, we make decisions. And too often when we're at these battlefields, the stories that are told are the stories that one might call bedtime stories. They're the stories of heroism, of valor, of sacrifice, of devotion. And those stories need to be told. They're meaningful stories. But there are other stories there. There are stories there that are tragic. There are stories that remind us that the reverberations of this battlefield here at Gettysburg, where I am, that they were felt not just in the moment in 1863 and not just here in Adams County and not just in these armies, but those reverberations were felt deeply and profoundly on those home fronts. That linkage, that connection between those families, those wives, those children and the men in the ranks recovering that is I think the greatest honor we can do to these soldiers. There's not a battlefield tour I don't get in which I, I don't situate, right? I should say, I always situate these men right, within their family lives. Because at the end of the day, that's the underlying reason why they did what they did. So I'm just looking at time here. I'm make sure I give us some time for conversation. So I'm going to, I'm just going to show you a quick picture of this man. And... I'm here in my library tonight. This is this is teasing you all. It's unfair to do. This man is Charles Bowen. And I'm sure you all have at one time thought, man, if I make it, uh, you know, to the pearly gates, who do I want to see? Who do I want to meet? And uh, number one on my list, and I mean it, number one on my list is this man, Charles Bowen. His letters. And I got the plastic wrap on this, which I'm sorry for. The Civil War Letters and Diaries of Sergeant Charles Bowen. Uh, the Press Butternut uh, is out of business. It's hard to find this book now. I'm telling you, these letters are absolutely phenomenal. Charles Bowen. Charles Bowen. It's, it's called Dear Friends at Home is the time. He pulled back the curtains when he wrote home. He not only conveyed some of his innermost thoughts and feelings, but he was descriptive, he was critical, and he was a field hand, farm hand from Utica, New York. And he went 
through it all with the Army of the Potomac. And I mean all. Seven days, Gaines' Mill, Malvern Hill, 2nd Manassas, Antietam. He's in the regulars, and they regular barely saw any fighting in Antietam, except for his regiment, and they got into hand-to-hand -hand fighting there. Fredericksburg, Sunken Road, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Wheatfield, it goes on. Overland came in, and the letters are incredible. And I'll say it again, if you get a chance, this is a fantastic book. And he, Bowen, he captures that spirit of pragmatism captures that spirit of pragmatism in thought as well as in ideas. This is a man who never lost his love for union, ever, and came to accept and to believe that emancipation was the right way to fight the war. Fascinating, fascinating man. All right, now we're going to go. That's his wife, by the way. I'm going to go to this. You know what? We're not going to do that. I'm going to go. Yeah. John Foster. John Foster. Uh, John Foster was a captain in a Pennsylvania regiment. I don't have it right in front of me. I'll tell you all here in just a moment. Uh, he fought here at Gettysburg, was wounded on Little Round Top. Uh, wound was fairly serious, did knock him out of the war, but he was able to return to his regiment. He's in the 155th PA. He was able to return to his regiment in spring 64 before the Overland Campaign. You see, he's got some stripes. I shouldn't say some stripes. He has um, uh, his lieutenant bars uh, that are on his uniform. Uh, this was before those bars arrived. They had not. And his captain was not going to allow him to have the privileges of being a lieutenant. He said, in fact, to Foster that he had to stay in the ranks and shoulder a musket. And Foster wrote to his wife, and his letters are phenomenal. John Foster. I don't have the title off the top of my head, but you can find it, 155th PA. They are phenomenal, and they are, everyone will perk up here. I have never read more sexually graphic letters in my entire life. And this guy, whoa, I'll just tell you, they, it's just, we're all adults. In one of his letters, he tells his wife, I don't know where he thought he was an expert on this, he told his wife how she should masturbate. I mean, it's really, it's incredibly revealing. And he's so open that he told her before the wilderness that he's going to deserve. It. Just right there. I'm doing it. I'm not going to stay in the ranks. He believed he was being mistreated uh, by his officer. Fighting started. And he, in fact, he did just that. He slipped away. And he got to Fredericksburg. He somehow talked his way on the train to get up to Washington. He played himself as a lieutenant, as an officer. But he did not have the bars on his uniform. He had a few other men with him. They had a little bit of money. They got off the train. They didn't report, of course, as being wounded. Again, I don't know how he managed to get as far as he did, but he knew he was on borrowed time. So what did he do? He got himself into a boarding house with these other two men, hid out. And on occasion, they were able, of course, because they had a little bit of money, get themselves some food and he got himself a newspaper. And what did he read? He read about the 155th PA, man. They were taking it on the chin during the Overland campaign, taking some pretty heavy losses. I suspect Foster thought that he had made a very good decision. And he, in fact, said this. I'm going to play lieutenant for a while. In fact, as long as I can't, I don't care what the consequences are. They can't more than shoot me. Actually, they could, Mr. Foster. They can't call me a skedaddler. And there's the key part, my friends. They can't call me a skedaddler. Do you see that Foster's sense of devotion, which we too often say Civil War soldiers were men of duty, End of story. Man, that sense of duty, that idea of duty, it was expansive, it was fluid, it changed. John Foster says, I'm not a skedaddler. Why? Because he had built a combat record, wounded here a little round top. And to him, his sense of duty had been what? Fulfilled. To him, his veteran combat status gave him a prerogative. There is pragmatism. There is pragmatism. I'm not suggesting to you that duty did not prescribe a strict way of behaving. There were parameters, but it certainly confined or constrained choices without a doubt. But duty wasn't a singular thing. Duty did not make Civil War soldiers fight in a mechanical way, and Foster is proof of it. So Foster finally gets a little bit nervous, and he's thinking, you know, um, even though we told his wife, and I quote him, I cannot stand it out in the front any longer. But then he realized, he said to his wife, if I am found out, I will get myself into some trouble. 
So I will get back and get myself right. So at the end of May, right, as the Overland campaign was winding down, he headed back to his regiment, back to his regiment. And of course, he did not get into any trouble as he predicted, but when he entered the regimental camp, he saw his captain. His captain spotted him, turned and walked in the other way. And Foster wrote to his wife, I, I don't understand why he was so angry. <laughs> Well, I got to guess, because you left your buddies back in Washington, right? As they were getting shot up during the Overland campaign. But for Foster, that what we might call shirking of duty did not in any way, any way, contradict, a man, contradict his deep conviction about the cause of union. His belief that any dissent against the war was wrong. In 1863, he wanted to go back to his home community where there were dissenters against uh, the war. And he said that he would relish the opportunity to take his musket and to go after them. So here you have it, a man who could see himself, who saw himself as a man committed to the union cause. Now I'm gonna give you one last example here. And it's gonna be a very quick one. And it is of, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. This builds upon the theme that I just mentioned of honor and duty and how it was malleable or flexible. And above all, the word for the day here, at least for my talk, is what? It is pragmatism. Holmes, he is, illustrates that pragmatism almost, I think, better than anyone else that I write about in my book. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., as you probably know, he was wounded at Ball's Bluff, wounded at Antietam, might have been wounded a third time, sick at Fredericksburg, he didn't fight there. But by 1864, Oliver Wendell Holmes has had a sharp exchange with his father. I mean, they were certainly very close, both just smart as hell. And he was, Holmes was already irritated with his father after Fredericksburg. His father wrote a piece, I don't remember where it was published, but his father basically concluded that in the wake of this horrible fiasco in Fredericksburg, right, the census casualties that occurred in front of Lee's Heights, his father wrote that ultimately that the North would prevail and it would prevail because that the Northern cause was a just cause, that the Northern cause had God on their side and that ultimately, ultimately morality would prevail and that's what would decide the outcome of the war. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, when he read that, he wrote his dad and he rebuked him for such nonsense. He said that this war was not gonna be won by the side that was the most virtuous. He said, this war was gonna be won by the side that was professional. The men who came to do their duty and to do their duty with discipline, to do their duty with efficiency, to do their duty effectively. And Holmes said to his dad, he said, man, what Maurice Heights, what we saw there is that we saw men who didn't just blindly go to their death. What we saw at Maurice Heights were volunteers who were now what? They were serious, professional-minded soldiers. And by 64, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he believes, Junior, believes that he has had enough. And he writes his parents about that. It's July 7th, by the way. Excuse me, June 7th, 1864. I started in this saying a boy, and I'm now a man, and I have been coming to the conclusion for the last six months that my duty has changed. I can do a disagreeable thing or face a great danger coolly enough when I know it is a duty. but a doubt demoralizes me, as it does any nervous man. And now I honestly think the duty of fighting has ceased for me, ceased, because I have laboriously and with much suffering of mind and body earned the right to decide for myself how I can best do my duty to myself, country, and if you choose, to God. And here you have it, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., like so many other Civil War soldiers. They charted their course in the war through situational thinking. Situational thinking that did not diminish ideas or ideology. He, like so many other soldiers, believed in the cause for which they fought, believed in the high ideas that this nation was aspiring for. But when we take those ideas, if we extract them from that physical world, if we overlook how those conditions were always changing, and above all else, 
if we fail to find in these men the contradictions and the tensions that they were confronting, how they wrestled with them, and how they didn't always iron them out, that's the Civil War soldier that you'll find in my book. It is not the Civil War soldier who looked at the world clear eyed thinking, and then who did what? Who moved forward with purpose, with determination, on a very straight line. That straight line had a lot of zigzags in it. So I thank you all for being uh, part of the audience uh, tonight. And before we have questions, I just want to say this very quickly. Civil War Institute that I'm the director of, the second weekend of June, we have a conference. The conference begins on Friday and runs through the weekend. You can stay Monday and Tuesday and do Battle for Tours. It's a conference this year that has Gary Gallagher, Brooke Simpson, Joan Wall, Terry Janey, uh, Keith Bohannon. We do a wide range of topics. And this is an important note because you're part of this audience. Um, you are, in my mind, a member of what I'd call a round table. And we give you all a 15% discount to come. If you have any questions at all, I'm going to put in the chat box here in just a moment. My email address, please send me an email. I'm happy to give you information about it. Second weekend in June, um, an array again of different talks. We do battlefield tours on that Saturday night as well. There is always something for somebody there. Uh, you'll find it. Okay. Thank you again so much. And again, I welcome any questions or comments. Okay. If you want to use the question and answer icon, uh, uh, please use that for any questions. That way, if we don't get to everything, I can uh, download them and send them to uh, Professor Carmichael. Uh, first question, and you may, you, you, in a certain way, you answered it. Uh, this is from Richard. Have there been any major changes in perspective on the lives and experiences of Civil War soldiers since Bell Wiley wrote The Life of Johnny Reb and The Eye for Billy Yank many years ago? Certainly. So I'm glad that those two books were mentioned. They are books that are, uh, I think, very important books. The very first to do what we call social history of the common soldier. The very first one uh, Wiley did was The Life of Johnny Reb. Uh, what he did on two levels. Uh, first, he was very sensitive to the material culture, what you would call it, or the materiality of soldiers, whether it be their uniforms, their equipment, the food. And then he also looked at their daily lives. That again, sort of foreshadows the rise of social history in the 1960s. And, uh, Bill Wiley was a little bit ahead of the curve. But what we see here and why it was so profound is that this is not the civil war of great battles in general. So that's the first thing that he did. Um, and I think that the second part is that he suggested that actually the common soldier wasn't particularly ideological. And so that the work of James McPherson and Joe Glattar, they're the very first two actually Glattar is, they're the first to start to recover the ideas of the common soldier. Uh, so Wiley's books, which I have, I think right here in front of me, are well worth, there it is, look at this. I even have a first edition. I'm gonna boast about that. There it is, Life of Johnny Red, with I think even a letter from Bill Wiley in here. Um, it's, a, I, I, it's a mess. It's still in print, it's in paperback, Life of Johnny Red. It's absolutely worth your time. This next question is from, from Joe. Um, the question has to do with, have you been able to compare your thoughts on motivations to previous wars? Although obviously the written record is, is sparser for those earlier periods, but have you looked back uh, into history and see how the Civil War soldier may or may not been similar to earlier wars? So I would say that I feel a little bit more comfortable talking about wars post uh, Civil War. Um, so let, let's, let me do this. So here's the first thing. So if you take 18th century wars well into up to the Spanish American War, that the technology and the use of linear tactics, uh, that, that creates somewhat of a common experience. And that what we see in terms of the training of soldiers through that period is a training in which the soldier is to be a part in a machine, that there is no individuality, no initiative, uh, no creativity that is required or needed of that soldier. In fact, that's the last thing that you absolutely want. And so there's one thread that I think runs through that. And then when you see, when the tactics change and break from linear formations, 
but obviously in World War I, and you have the use of machine guns, and then you have the dispersion, and that's the key word that I'm looking for here. You have tactics of dispersion. It becomes a very different experience on the battlefield. And again, the technology has everything to do with that where you find that individual soldiers now have a little bit more initiative, a little bit more creativity, and a little bit more control in terms of how they fight. And again, I'm obviously working at the very broadest level of generalizations when, when I make that. I think that the other thing about trauma, if you want to see comparisons, I've not thought at all or read anything about battlefield trauma from um, the American Revolution through the Mexican War. I don't know if any work on that. The book that I'd highly recommend to you all This is an underappreciated, undervalued book. Uh, hold up here for a while. It's got a great title. You can still get it. It's not cheap. I wish it were. Shook Over Hell by Eric Dean Jr. I, I can't say enough good things about it. I'll tell you about him in just a second. I'll give you a moment to write it down. Shook Over Hell. It's Eric Dean Jr. It's also, of course, everything's Amazon, but Harvard's published it. And for paperback, it's expensive. I think it's a great book. I'm going to tell you why. So what this book does, it compares uh, Civil War soldiers to Vietnam soldiers. It looks, one, at their experiences in the field, in battle, as well as the experience of coming home. What Dean finds is some radical differences. Uh, but what he also finds is that Civil War soldiers, of course, experience trauma and some endure what we would call PTSD. Dean is, you know, hold the book back up here. He is very precise about his definition of PTSD, which I appreciate. And for him, it's a, it's a man or a woman whose memories become so intrusive that they are uncontrollable and that those memories then start to dictate or control behavior. Right? That's critical. It's not just that you have a bad memory, right? And it's not just that uh, at times you might feel depressed or demoralized by what you've gone through. It's about a memory that is intruding. That's the key part. And that, that intrusion that it controls or shapes behavior. Now, look, everyone can have their own definition about it, but that is Dean's. What Dean relied upon were records from uh, a mental institution in Indianapolis. And those uh, records are of family members who've had uh, to institutionalize um, you know, you know, a, a father, a grandfather who had gone through hell. And uh, the accounts are harrowing, they're horrible, right? including a man who had survived Andersonville. And his daughter said that the man was so obsessed with Andersonville that if you met him for the first time, he would immediately start to talk about it. And that that obsession led him to build in the backyard a model uh, of the Andersonville prison. Now, what's in this book, why many of you would enjoy it, Dean took a lot of flack for this, but I think he makes a powerful case that there is a myth about the Vietnam soldier being abandoned by his government. Now, before you get on me about that, read the book first. I think he makes a really compelling case, an important one. And in fact, he shows with very strong evidence that federal resources, national resources that have been devoted to veterans have increased dramatically since World War II, including the Vietnam era. And there is, and his, his ultimate point is this, and it's fascinating to me, is that we now see in, we see now the soldier as a victim. And that's largely because of Vietnam. Whereas the Civil War, that veteran, some people might have pity on that man for whatever hard times or troubles that soldier had adjusting as in, in peace or as a veteran. People see that, but ultimately, you know, the veteran who returned home from the Civil War was understood and seen in a very heroic way. Now, Dean's not saying that's what should happen with Vietnam veterans. He's saying what's powerful here is that that image of the Vietnam veteran as a victim, right? Look what war does to people. That that now has become the yardstick, the moral yardstick in which we as a nation now judge whether we should go to war, right? It's a fascinating, again, there's a very different view, right? You just think about, I was looking at uh, Fredericksburg today, right? You, you, the 20th Massachusetts, th that's the Harvard Regiment, right? That regiment lost 100 men in a 50-yard space in the town of Fredericksburg. 100 men, right? Just there. 
And then you think about the assaults against Marie Sykes, that's 8,000. You think about the toleration that we have as a nation for casualties and what we are willing now to allow our men and women to endure, to be subjected to in combat situations. And listen, I'm not making a political statement here. I'm not saying that we're right or we're wrong. I just make this point, how different, how things have changed. The toleration for the sacrifice of blood during the Civil War is very different. Hell, look at Pickett's charge. Then General Pickett is immortalized, and he believed, as many of the survivors did, that they were what? That they had acted in a glorious way. Man, if you suffer 50% casualties in any military operation today, my hunch is you're what? Your career is over. Done. Right? Done. But the one of the reasons why we feel that way is out of Vietnam, we see the soldier now as a victim. That's what we see. That's Dean's argument. So again, it is absolutely worth your time. Absolutely worth your time to be clear. Hey, Peter, some folks want you to kill your share screen so they can just see your smiling face. <laughs> they want me to do what now? Oh, share screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Kill your okay, share screen. Kill yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm, you would okay. see that I would, I would be more. I'm going to interrupt you. You were on a roll. No, that's all right. I'm so sorry, y'all. Oh, no, no. No, no, you should. My poor students, they just. You know, I, I, this is all payback. You know, man, I used to laugh with my dad all the time when he couldn't use the remote control, and now it's coming back hard against me. Yeah. This question, this question comes from Brian, and I don't know this book. Does Wilbur Hinman C. Craig yeah, provide a good example of the common soldier? Yeah, man, I love that book. Look at this. It's like show and tell here, huh? Oh, it's good to be in your library, huh? And I love being in my library, I'm telling you. So, yes, it is a great book. It is a fictional account. It's a made-up regiment. I think it's something like the 200th Indiana or something like that. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, and in fact, I think he, Hinman, in this, um, he downplays ideology, but what he does is he shows how the young, idealistic uh, recruit, full of adventure, how the war changes all of that. And this is a fantastic read. And I, I was shocked. You know, I was a reenactor when I was a kid. And we read Hardtack and Coffee, and, you know, some of those other classics. I, I never, ever heard of this. But this is something that's kind of a Bible amongst reenactors, re and it should be a Bible amongst historians. And there it is, Corporal State Click and his part. It's a great book. It's a great book. This, okay, this question is from Matt. Um, I think he's more looking at life in general in the era of the Civil War. Were, were, were the soldiers that much different from the general population, except for being younger physically, than what you would see in the general population? No, absolutely not. So in 1861, they are an absolute reflection of the societies that sent them off to war. That goes uh, also to include class on both sides. Uh, neither side did this become a rich man's war or a poor man's fight, uh, particularly on the, on the Confederate side. I will say what I was trying to allude to before, well, I'm about to do a get my books all back here. It is. But the men, as the war progressed, they certainly saw that they um, felt estranged, and this may be too strong of a word, uh, but they certainly believed that the people back home could not understand what they were going through. And they, in part, contributed to this. A big part of my book is trying to help us understand the act of writing letters and the projection of experiences. And these men, understandably, wanted to be seen by the people back home as noble boys off fighting, doing their duty. And so they wrote letters from time to time that sanitized war. But then these very same soldiers complained that the people back home didn't fully appreciate the rigors and the hardships and the suffering and the trials and all that. Well, hell man, they're sending them letters it's giving them a very, what I might say, slanted view of the war. So that sense, and again, estrangement is too strong of a word, uh, but certainly they felt at times at odds with the people back home, and they often turned to the very people they were fighting against. And we've gone too far with that, thinking that at you know, every picket post, Johnny Reb and Billy Yang came together and, and swapped stories and, and shared whiskey. That's all nonsense. Uh, but there certainly were interactions in which the men clearly felt that there was a bond and a bond because of their shared experiences that people have come to know. And there's a book I mentioned to you all before, Embattled Courage by Gerald Linderman. And uh, 
it's, I think it's, I think it's James McPherson takes this book on pretty hard. And I think he scores McPherson does some important points against it, but this is still worth your time. Still worth your time and battle courage, Gerald Lindemann. There's a, a book that was written in the 1950s, uh, uh, Jesse Glenn Gray, Warriors, Reflections on Men in Battle. Have you ever looked at that one? I, I, I do not know that book. Well, he talks about the uh, close combat becoming a transformational experience on the part of soldiers, that they're no longer homo sapiens. They, they become homo fuentes or fighting man. Uh -huh. Is that something you saw or did the, the soldiers still think that they were so much similar to the civilian society? You know, it's, it, again, it's, it varies so much. I, I just want to get, I think, a recognition that they had become different people, uh, but they still drew from, and here's the key part I, I, I don't want to let go of, but they were still drawing meaning from the same core values, and those core values come from what's called sentimentalism. In sentimentalism, there was a belief that an individual action would shape and change the course of events. Through individual action, a man could show that he had character. And that individual action ultimately had to be about bravery and discipline and moral living. That belief, although it certainly was chipped away at during the course of the war, that belief, it stood the course of the war. That belief is what united Southerners and Northern soldiers with their respective families. And that belief is why in part, but not entirely, why we see 1863, Garrett Pickett's charge, and why we see similar attacks and charges being made all the way in 1864. Now there is discipline that is behind that. There is coercion that is behind that. These are our armies. There's not a lot of free will, but there still was a belief because the weaponry in the allowed for it, that individual bravery and heroism could still carry the day. The great myth, again, is because people don't understand Civil War tactics. Frontal attacks during the Civil War were not always doomed to failure. Frontal attacks during the Civil War were out of necessity. That's not what Civil War officers preferred. But of course, for a flanking attack to occur, you got to have secrecy and the enemy to, to cooperate with you to some degree. I did not been very often. But frontal attacks did work. And there are plenty of examples of them all the way to the end of the war. Part of that belief is faith in leadership, right? There's discipline, there's a punishment if you don't do it, but there's also a belief that bravery and, and that raw bravery, that raw, that, that matters, and that it would that it would decide the, the, the course of events. I'm gonna combine two questions from sure. Joe and Alexander. Uh, one is looking at the commitment to the cause by Union and Confederate soldiers, was it different? And then one, did the Emancipation Proclamation or knowledge of the Emancipation Proclamation change attitudes on either North or South? Okay, so let's do the first one again real quickly. I'm sorry. It, it was the sense of commitment to the cause different in Union and Confederate soldiers? So, you know, again, it varies within each, each army. I would say a lot comes down to social class and position so that if you, know, you look at the Army of Northern Virginia after Gettysburg, you're going to see a lot of discontent. And that discontent is not just among North Carolina soldiers, but there is a spike in desertion. And for those Virginia soldiers who decided to go home after Gettysburg, they could go home, touch that base and get back to the army. And that wouldn't be seen as desertion. It would be AWOL. Whereas in North Carolina, you got to make that trek down there. You're not going to just turn around and come right back. But the point is, is that that sense of loyalty, it has a break. And that break is in large part because of Gettysburg and the logistical breakdown after that battle. You can look at the Army of Tennessee. There's another breakdown. It's after Missionary Ridge. So it's fluid. It depends on social class. Same thing for the Army of the Potomac. Man, it is an utter disarray after Fredericksburg. But by January, there's something like 100, 200 men that are deserting every day. Those men, I suspect, came from a wide variety of classes. Now you take a Union soldier who's down in Vicksburg. He might hate the war. He might be disgruntled, but he's in Vicksburg. If he's from Illinois, good luck getting home, right? So that guy might have the same impulse and the same lack of commitment, but there's no way in hell he's going to be able to get himself back there. The, the emancipation, you know, um, here's what's pretty remarkable, I think. When we look at, we'll look at the North and I'll be quick, and then we'll look at the South. 
Here's what's remarkable. I get tired when people say, well, look at these Northern soldiers. They didn't care about slavery. There's a bunch of racists. Okay, fine. We know that. That's hardly a revelation. But what deserves our scrutiny, and to me, some respect, is that these men, who in fact upheld ideas about race and that were, of course, you know, beyond the pale, particularly by our standards, they weren't abolitionists. But here's what's remarkable, and there's pragmatism. When faced and confronted with the reality of a war in which stakes were so high, that they were able to change and shape their racial attitudes to be able to accept the inclusion of African Americans as soldiers. Now, one might say that that's, you know, that was a cynical move on their part. Uh, well, so be it, I guess, but I think that it speaks to how people's attitudes change. They usually don't change because of a speech, which we should all know about this now, right? Or reading something in the newspaper. That, that's not how people change, change, how their ideology shifts. Their ideology shifts when what? Something foundational has changed in a radical and profound way. And the war, of course, is what? It is what jars people's thinking into new ways. And so, yes, I would say most Northern soldiers made that adjustment. My man, Charles Bowen, he chided his mother. His mother blamed black soldiers for the failure at the crater. And he wrote her, he referred to black soldiers as smoked Yankees. He said, these smoked Yankees, they have something to fight and die for, and that is their freedom. That's not the Charles Bowen you would have found in 1861. And for the Confederates, man, it is game on when emancipation comes. And again, no surprise about that, that they recognize that those folks who said, beware of Abraham Lincoln, he's nothing but what? what they call him a black Republican, right? He's an abolitionist in disguise. That's what he is. And Northerners are saying, no, 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 just wants to stop slavery spread in the territories. Well, Lincoln did believe that. But then the war came. And then 1862, right, preliminary pro uh, proclamation, followed by the official on January 1st, 1863. And there you have white Southerners, especially those fire eaters, right? Back in 1860, saying what? We told you so. Yeah, told you so. Told you. This is not about war for union. This is about war to overhaul and destroy our way of life, which, of course, at its core, was slavery. Okay. Last question. This is All from right. Tina. Has sentimentalism level of thinking changed since the Civil War? I'd say that there's almost no vestige of it at all. Tina, and you're going to give me an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite and underrated Civil War soldier books, Civil War Stories by Francis Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. Tina, you're going to love this book. It's fantastic, and it really uncovers that web of ideas and values between home front and soldiers and how it was tested during the war. She does, Clark, does not care for and battle courage at all. She takes it on pretty hard. This is an absolutely underappreciated, underrated book on the common soldier. It's a little academic at times, but you know what? It's worth trudging through it. Absolutely worth it. Before we go here, I just, I just want to say, folks, you write me. Send me can I type my email anywhere? Or am I not allowed to type on this thing? Uh, you can't type on the thing, but what I can do is when I send notice about the uh, lecture being posted online, I can include your email if you're fine with that. I would, I, absolutely. Yeah, no, I would love that because, you know, I'd love to see you all uh, at the Civil War Institute anytime. And I think you all would really enjoy it. And sorry, I can't see your faces. I'm sorry I left my screen up for so long, but and such is life. But it was a real pleasure to be able to talk to you all this evening. And please, everyone, stay safe and I hope to see you up again. Well, I want to thank you for a very entertaining and educational talk tonight. Uh, I mean, you bring a degree of enthusiasm to the uh, to the podium that uh, a few some few times do we see. Uh, but but that I think that is, is part of your of, of your, agree, your draw. You gotta have energy, right? You gotta do yep, it. You gotta have energy, and we will uh, we will also highlight your book when we uh, let folks know. And then uh, for those who want to come back to one of these programs, we will have one in about two weeks. Uh, it's by Aidan McGee, and it looks, we're going to jump a century. Uh, we're going to look at the, the counterintelligence of U.S. and Soviet military liaison missions from 1947 to 1960. That was all the military stuff that went back and forth, where we would send uh, detachments of soldiers into the Warsaw Pact to do evaluations. 
and at the same thing, the Soviet would do the same things. And how we played games, exactly called the Cold War, Wilderness of Mirrors. How we how we hid stuff that we didn't want them to see and showed them stuff that we did. So I invite you here for two week in two weeks. And again, I'll see you down there at Gettysburg here in the near future. So again, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining us. And, and please do come back. Good night. Thank you. Okay.